Welcome everyone, this is the YPO Hub in Davos 2020, and I am ever so grateful. Hala Thomas Dotter has been our very first person to say yes, she would come and speak to our audience of CEOs last year. And as soon as I asked this year, you were more than uh, gracious in saying you'd do it. Uh, and you're, as CEO of B Team, I think your entire ethos is so resonant with the conversations here mm. on the street. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing, and then let's talk about leadership. Let's do that. Thanks for having me, and, and thanks for those of you who are here today. Uh, so the B Team is um, a group of global leaders from civil society and business who set out about seven years ago with the notion that doing business as usual was no longer an option. And now these are all leaders who lead big global companies like Mark Benioff from Salesforce and Paul Pullman, then the CEO of Unilever and, and people like Ajay Benga at MasterCard and really successful leaders. But they basically think that the way we've been doing business has left us with a burning planet, a melting ice cap, um, a broken social contract and unsustainable levels of inequality in the world, and the lowest trust that business and other institutions in our society enjoy in our lifetimes. So they said there has to be a better way of, um, we didn't create, no one goes into business because you want to ruin the world. We go into the business because we want to solve an issue in the world. So these leaders had the courage to come together and say together let's try to figure out how do we do business so that we take care of the well-being of people and planet as we are in pursuit of profit? How do we put purpose at the heart of business? How do we exercise principled leadership? And how do we find the courage and the humility to know that these times call for us to transform ourselves in order to transform our organizations, in order to transform the world? And so I'm very privileged to get to serve this big, bold agenda as we try to tackle things that range from the climate crisis, which is very much a theme of Davos this year, to these unsustainable levels of inequalities. And, 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 and then last but not least, how do we think about governance and transparency and responsibility in business so that we may earn the trust of society and this is a key issue that we've been discussing. We launched here uh, Trust, the Edelman Trust Index was discussed here this morning. Mm -hmm. We've been polling our CEOs and had thousands of responses all around this issue of trust. A real fear that business is losing touch with, mm -hmm. on a very basic level, with their consumers. And as soon as you lose that trust, you lose the credibility, you, you start having the protests that we've been seeing, people feeling disenfranchised, mm -hmm. not part of the system. There's a, there's a real issue there. But we believe that business can be a force for good, but understand that leadership is a key part of that. In the 70 years of YPO, leadership has been, and better leaders, is something that we've been focused on. And I'd like to hear your thoughts, mm -hmm. not just from BT, but just personally, because you're such a fascinating background besides before and besides what you were doing at B Team, uh, about leadership mm -hmm. and some messages that you would share with, with our peers in, in 130 countries, so culturally different places. Yeah. You know, what does it mean? Well, thank you. Well, first I'd like to say that I think in many ways we used to do business in the way that we're now talking about being important. So I actually believe almost anyone who goes into business, any entrepreneur I've known, and I've been an entrepreneur myself, and I'm the daughter of an entrepreneur, goes into business because you want to do right. You want to solve a problem there is. You want to do right by your employees. You want to do right by your customers. Otherwise, your business doesn't grow. And you, of course, don't want to finish the resources of the natural environment because then there is no future for your business. So in many ways, I would say private businesses and, and the old way of doing business uh, has always been about this, I've been about stakeholders. Um, and that's the key to success because you want to attract the best people to work for you and all of that. It's kind of common sense. But what happened is we had this doctrine about 50 years ago. As a matter of fact, this year, it's 50 years since Milton Friedman put out this sort of idea that the purpose of an organization was to ret maximize return to shareholders. And, you know, I think we're questioning that notion because that economic system has left us with massive challenges. And I also would say, even if you like that, if you think the purpose of the organization is to serve only the shareholder, 
the only way to serve the shareholder long term now, because expectations in society have changed, is to take care of your employees, your customers, your planet, because they're the, that's what the generation of talent wants from you. That's what your customers increasingly expect from you. And that's what investors are increasingly looking for when they have started to invest with what we typically call an environmental, social, and governance lens, or ESG lens. So society's norms have shifted, or are shifting fast, but we kind of continue, at least in large businesses, to largely do business in a way where the shareholder has a higher status than all the other stakeholders that need to be okay for business to be there in the future. And so what should our CEOs be focused on amongst, because you've raised yeah. just a whole number of things there, um, and it's a bit daunting. You say, you know, I want to be a better leader. I get the point. And, and of course, my consumers, my staff, all the uh, constituents that I have to serve as a leader are pulling me in various directions. Help, how do, you, how do you do this? And if you have a listed business, you're not always getting a lot of support from your board or your investors because they're still in the shareholder supremacy model. And yet your other stakeholders, your employees, even your children, um, and your customers are pulling in a different direction. So it's not easy. And I'm not here to maintain that. But I think what happened in 2019 is very powerful. So two groups of... Um, Citizens really changed, I think, um, the way we're talking in Davos this year. And it was our kids. The next generation has taken to the street and it's asked us, you know, are you taking care of our future? Are we going to have the same opportunities as you've had? And so whether they are on climate strikes or whether they are voting with their feet in the way they consume or the way they choose where to work and where not to work, really, um, is changing and our kids are asking challenging questions. I've had many conversations with CEOs who told me that Thanksgiving in the US was all about what is our environmental footprint, you know, what am I doing? And, and I love that. So kids, please continue to raise your voices. But these kids are the future of our business. They are our employees. And already those generations at work are asking the same questions. So I would say employee activism and our kids kind of rising and hold, asking us to hold ourselves responsible, not just for our short-term success, but to the long-term success that they can face, so, is the game-changing yes. thing that's happened. I'd like to focus on that a bit because we have some, we have young next generation YNG who are basically our kids, mm -hmm. and uh, some of them are here, there's uh, thousands of them around the world. Mm -hmm. What are some ideas that you could share for them, because YPO is an inclusive, yeah. as an organization, it's about the members, but it's also about our spouses, our partners, and, and our children. We want to help them. Give some thoughts or guidance for them. Yeah, and I, I would like to actually leave you at the end, at least with some um, concrete call to actions. Yes. But first, this notion, so what is leadership? Is leadership something that is given to Paul Pullman when he was CEO of Unilever, or Mary Robinson, who's also a B-team leader? because he was president of Ireland? Or is leadership something that is available to all of us? So to the young kids out there, to anyone out there, leadership is inside of every one of us. It's a choice if we're going to exercise it. How are we going to bring our voice and values to a world that feels incredibly broken and certainly needs more innovation? So I just want to start with that message. There's a leader inside of every one of us. Leadership is not given to the few. And these times call for it, and we're seeing examples of it. So that's sort of the first thing. But if I gave you concrete things to really think about. As a business leader, um, and even in your personal life, if you're not embracing responsibility for the sustainability of your organization or your lifestyle, if you're not setting a goal to try to be carbon neutral and half your emissions by 2030, then you are probably going to face irrelevance because that is what we need to do, but it's also what we're now expected to do. So think about that. Think about how you joined the bold and the brave in this world and set a, an example for yourself. On a personal level, there are lots of ways to do it, but it's mostly about using your vote to bell. <laughs> it's mostly about raising your voice and vote. But I want to go to a second thing that I'm so passionate about, because I actually have this belief, and I've had that for 25 years, if not more, that maybe we could really fix all of the challenges we have in the world with one simple action, 
and that is if we could have gender balance in leadership. If I, I was just going to take you there anyway, because it's such an easy thing to, 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 to discuss with you. We have had an issue, uh, YPO is 70 years old, and it's for leaders of organizations, and we don't make the demographics. You know what the statistics are of all businesses, so yeah. it's not nothing to do with YPO. Uh, when, I, when I joined YPO 28 years ago, uh, we've come a long way. I'll come back, we're 900% better than we were, yeah. but we were 1% of YPO as were women. Now it's nine. This year, very delighted that not only do we have a woman chairman, but also um, a, a, a good representation on our board. But it's challenging, yeah. and it's challenging to us as an organization because we, we do reach out to yeah. have women join organizations like this, but it's a challenge because of the balance that they have between their careers, the families, and their priorities. Mm. You've been doing it all. Trying. <laughs> Share with some outside the YPO world, women that we would love to engage in the platform, because we can't, we can invite, mm. but how do you convince women that they should go outside, even they've done the hard day's work, mm. They have a family, and then on top of it, to join organizations, peer groups like ourselves. Tell. Well, first, yeah, I mean, so many things we could go into here from the personal to the systemic uh, challenges we're facing. But it's very clear that currently we have more white men named Steve in the boardroom than we have women in the world. And so around the power tables in the world, <laughs> this is true. And so how in the world are we going to confront the crisis of conformity, business as usual, that's brought us to this desperate place in history by continuing to engage with people who are exactly the same? So to me, I am not here to say that this is only about women's rights or human rights. It's about all of that. Let's do right and let's empower all of our human capital. It makes business sense. It's the right thing to do. I'm here to say that gender balance goes beyond counting women versus men. Gender balance is about what are the values at the heart of how we do business and how we think about our economy. And if we get that gender balance right and we allow men to embrace feminine leadership, because feminine leadership is needed now. And it's not just women who can bring that to the table. But when we have a greater gender balance, we're far more likely to talk not just about how we compete hard, but also how we care deeply about people and the planet. And without caring deeply about people and the planet, we're not gonna attract the best talent in the world. We're not gonna remain, or, or sort of maintain customer loyalty. And we're actually, I just spoke with BlackRock right before coming here. They're very serious about the fact that they wanna put an ESG lens on all of their investments. So if we have any desire to remain relevant to any of our stakeholders, we just have to change the way we think. And I think the simplest way to get there is change who is around the power tables and then change how you do power so that it is more inclusive. So to me, gender balance is definitely about girl power. I've always believed that girl power can and is changing the world. But it is about also giving freedom to the great men who are willing to transform themselves and start leading in a way that actually works for humanity. I'll share a little bit about our strategy. I want to come to what your B-team strategy is to deliver this. So here in the YPO hub, we are having on loop on the screens downstairs, we've started an impact award. And we're trying to highlight those YPO leaders who are doing really great things. A friend of mine, Jan Borgstedt, uh, started a foundation out of Geneva called Womanity, mm -hmm. which I will confess I'm a trustee of, so th th I, I, I'm not entirely objective. But the idea is to help educate girls and get them into schools, and we're doing this in a number of countries. And he, he's one of the uh, f um, finalists for the award. And so our thought process is let's put, let's give a platform much as mm. we're doing now, mm. to these very important agenda items. Mm. And by highlighting the great exemplars um, who are doing in fantastic work. And so we're starting to do a little bit of that. Mm. That's a, a, some of our strategy. We've, we've refocused 70 years mm. ago. If you had mm. started having these conversations, even 50 years ago when Klaus Schwab did his 
um, manifesto, which apparently I've not checked this. I don't know if you have that um, the business roundtable agenda, and this is about 70% overlap. I don't know if you've had, had a chance to verify that. But it's interesting that these ideas are not new. It's just that the consumers have changed, societies have changed, and they're moving in the right direction. And we're trying to pivot. It'd be interesting. So that's kind of what we're doing. Share some of your strategies. What are you doing to help move this agenda? Yeah, I mean, there are so many um, things here to talk about, but the World Economic Forum has been measuring how long it will take us to close the gender gap for a while. And I happen to be from the country that has ranked number one for 10 years, Iceland. So, and I've been part of that movement for a long time. It's been, and I was seven years old when my mother and all of her um, women, the same age, went out to the streets and went on a strike. It was on 24th of October in 1975. So this is a long journey. And I would just uh, share that, um you had a fantastic electoral result. It ran for president of the country from in a very short time and got in a massive... So sorry, just had to put that in there. You've been yeah. very modest. Go on, sorry. Oh, no, it's not about modesty. It's about, but And I probably should add there, and then I want to go into what, how we think about it on the B team, that I've never really felt confident enough to do any of the things that I've done. And I think this is an important message because I know so many women and girls who hold back and think I'm not good enough or who am I to run for president? Who am I to become an entrepreneur? Who am I to ask for money for my business so that I can scale it? I think, so I've just given up on this, women need to be more confident because I think in some ways then we're telling women to become more like men and sorry men, because many of you have left this world in a mess. And so, <laughs> The Steves are just not getting the solution right. And so I just want to say this, and it's not because I don't know many great men. I'm working with so many of them that are so courageous. But I just think that my advice to anyone out there who thinks that they want to be part of creating a business or a world that works for humanity is to have the, have the humility to embrace courage and not wait to be confident. And so if you have the courage to be one of the people that's gonna be part of this new world, step up and find the courage and, and earn your confidence by doing. So God, I didn't know what I was doing when I decided to run for president. I ran as an independent candidate. I ran an entrepreneurial campaign. I had 1% in the polls shortly after I started. It was not an easy thing for me to do. Um, did not know what I was doing. Struggled with all kinds of barriers, systemic barriers that I think we have. So, so courage really matters, and courage matters for anybody in leadership today, but so does accountability. I would say courage and accountability, put those two words in your heart if you're in leadership today and, and you'll be okay. But what we're doing at the B team, speaking of courage and accountability, so one of our new B team members, who we've actually not publicly announced yet, leads a massive retail company, and he just set a goal that he's gonna close all gender gaps by 2022. Gender gaps in leadership and gender pay gaps, it's a decision. World Economic Forum says it takes us 100 years to close the gender gap in politics, 250 in the workplace. We do not have a century, not to mention two and a half centuries, to get this world right. So it's a decision. We're now in a decade of action. Anybody who wants to be relevant in business leadership, it's a decision. We do need to shift our definition of what a board director looks like or what a CEO looks like in order to do it or what an entrepreneur that we want to invest in looks like. Because our mindset is, even in Iceland, the most gender equal place in the world, after I ran for office, I went in to see teenagers and I asked them, please draw a picture for me of a president, of an entrepreneur, and of a teacher. And what did the kids do? Boys and girls, they drew a male president. I had just given a speech, I had just run for office. <laughs> They drew a male entrepreneur and they drew a female teacher. So let's be honest about the fact that we have mindsets that are old and they need to transform for us to remain relevant. And so I have seen in so many boardrooms, because in the Nordics we've put gender quotas in the boardrooms, I'm in favor of them, I used to be against them. I thought we could fix everything with private initiative. Gender quotas have actually been working for us in the Nordics. Is, is it this, works. It does, and is this 30% tipping point, something that you believe in? Three is, three is critical. So because what happens, and I've been the only female in the boardroom or in so many rooms. Just yesterday I was speaking to finance and asset owners about what are the challenges with getting to this future where we have carbon neutrality, etc. Only female around the table, of course, us to take the notes. 
I said I will do the notes if I also get to speak on behalf of the table so I can add my two cents to the speech. Um, and so sometimes we have to kind of have humor for the fact that we are still in minority. But what typically happens when you're a token, when you're one example of other, is that you have only one choice. You adopt the rules of the game as they have always been. It's not until you have relative balance that you start challenging the rules of the game. And these time call, times call for us on challenging the rules of the game. Now let me flip it, because I know many men may be listening. I think it's equally hard to be a token male with only females. So all of the conferences we've had around gender equality, and I've spoken at so many of them over 25 years now, and been part of so many initiatives that are amazing, and I love them, and the energy is amazing. But if there's one or two men, I like that's the best we see uh, in so many of them. So I think part of the problem with solving this lack of gender balance in the world is that we need to invite men to feel comfortable in that conversation because this isn't about women versus men. It is about shifting our ideas on how we lead and do business. Um, if we think we're going to change who's in power, we need to bring in those who are in power. And it so happens that 95% of CEOs are men and majority of board directors are men. So we need to get better. And, and I should take this also beyond gender because to me, inclusion is also about ethnic backgrounds. It's also about disability. It's also about paying living wages and listening to all the people that feel left behind and are now increasingly um, feeling desperate in the world because their quality of life hasn't gone up while those with money have enjoyed incredible success um, in the last decade and more. So I just think that we have to kind of be a lot more inclusive in who we listen to. And the risk that happens with many large companies that maybe doesn't happen as much as small companies is that we lose touch with those stakeholders. We don't listen anymore. And we think we know it all and have the answers and all is good for us. But all isn't good for us long term if we leave all of those people and voices behind. That's very true. And before I open up to questions which we'd like to take, a comment that just resonated, a memory. So within YPO, we have this thing called Forum, not the World Economic Forum, structured very different. It's very small, eight to 10 people. We meet fairly regularly. And some years ago, I had one woman and then another woman join our forum, which was difficult because I'm actually encouraged. I didn't even realize that statistic is 95% of CEOs are male. Well, we're on, only 91% male in YPO. It, we have a long way to go. And part of the struggle was exemplified by this little forum I had where we had, I think there were nine of us, two were women, and it just, they felt... It just was, one would never, it just wouldn't have survived at all. And even with a second, it wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. And eventually, they both left. Three is critical. So, so it, it's interesting. And I know we've seen it in our forums, and, and we have, and this is our forum structure, and we need to sort of pay attention to that. And I'll tell you one of our challenges, too. I have been recruiting women into YPO. It's, it's the first thing I, I did 28 years ago. That was my role in my uh, chapter, which was London. And... I would go and meet a very successful woman. I'd interview her, I'd tell her about YPO. I said, we're 99% male, I need you. You've, you've got to come and join us. And she'd listen, I'd tell her all about YPO and she'd say, oh, that sounds amazing, love it. Then the membership application would come through with her husband's name on it. And I would go to her, I said, I did all this work, we had dinner, I invited you to events, you told me you wanted to join said, yeah, but it'd be quite awkward for my husband to be there, you know, 99% of the membership is male, so the partners, 99%, more or less, are female, and he would feel awkward. Time and time again, I recruited woman after woman, some of the best entrepreneurs in England, and time and time, they're still members today, their husbands. And so it's, it, it's, it's how I, no longer did that. But so I don't um, know if you have any thoughts around that and then yeah. we open up to questions. I have personal experiences and thoughts. You should actually have brought my husband here. I, I think he deserves a lot more praise than I do because it takes an extraordinary amount of courage to actually tolerate a life with a woman like me because we are, you know, yeah, because of who I am. But also, 
you know, so I became the first woman to be the CEO of Iceland Chamber of Commerce in its 90 year history. There hadn't been a female CEO. And when I became a female CEO, I was supposed to host um, CEOs from other chambers in Iceland. And, um, and I received the documents from the year before when Sweden had hosted it. And the document said, and here's, this, here's the wife's program. So it was just assumed that every CEO of a chamber had to bring a wife. There wasn't a spouse's program, it was a wife's program. I know it's a small thing, but try to go home and tell your husband. So you're joining the wife's program, and that program is not about material issues in the world, it's about you will visit that museum, you will have shopping time, you will, like, you know, like, try to do that. It's not like, but my husband is, has extraordinary amounts of courage and confidence in his own skin, and his self-confidence doesn't come from being bigger than me. So part of the solution, and, and he actually takes pride in the fact that I get to do what I want to do, and he does his thing, and, and we support each other. So that partnering at home is part of the solution. And one of the greatest achievements we made in Iceland, and, and I know companies who've done this um, more now, um, is when we agree to give equal paternity and maternity leave, there are systemic issues and challenges in this conversation that we're having. Uh, but I just don't think we have time right now to solve all of that. So I guess my sort of, I'm begging all of you in leadership there to think about every time you have a slate for a new job, do you have a diverse slate? Is it gender balance? Do you have ethnic representation? Um, how are you thinking about filling your boardrooms? And if people are submitting, and, and I'm glad you've done all you've done to bring more women in, but if they're submitting you know, applications in their husband's name for some cultural norm reasons, like push back and, and, and let's um, have the courage to say this is not about women versus men. It is actually about the past versus the future. And if you want to be future proof, you just have to create organizations that embrace that gender balance or you're going to lose. Somehow balance. you're going to lose. That's fantastic. What a wonderful message. You've re-inspired me to do more. <laughs> I want to open it up to the floor. Uh, if somebody has a microphone, please, and would you pass? Yes, just wait for the mic a moment. I was a member of a forum where I was the only female, and there were 10, sometimes 13 men, nine. And actually, I loved it. They were like brothers for me. I think there's a special role for YPO for fathers to train their daughters. Mm -hmm. Because, and I'm curious if it's still highly family owned businesses, because that's how I became a president of a company. I was mentored by a father and a grandfather, and it gave me a lot of courage, and I could have that kind of informal dialogue on how to handle this situation or that one. And it gave me the confidence to even walk into a YPO room. So, all the YPO family trips and forums and resources. Is there programmatically a, a way to get fathers to teach their daughters and then also outside of YPO? Yeah, I, I will just take yeah. just that specific point, which is uh, ironically, and my, my son is sitting here, the, the only YPO um, family thing that I ever did was with my daughter, sort of father-daughter mm -hmm. thing, which was about leadership. And we went um, zero impact camping in the Rockies. It was a YPO program. I mean, it was awful for me. I mean, you don't know if you've ever done zero impact camping. It's um, it's very very basic, and <laughs> and she pushed me to do things, rappelling down a mountain. I did sort of fall upside down, crack my skull, but never mind. But it was just she pushed me. She pushed my limitations to a place that I would never have gone if it wasn't fact. You know, it's your daughter. You want to do everything to. You know, you're a father, so, so I think that you're right. There are things like that. Can we do more? I'm certain part of the reason we're here and the conversations we're having mm -hmm. is to explore. This, these are genuine conversations. We want to hear mm -hmm. ideas and come back with thoughts for next year. And we did a little bit of that last year. You wanted to say something else. Yeah, I think it's an excellent question. And I, my father was an entrepreneur and my mother did a care work. And I'm very happy for that combination because I do think it gave me the gifts of embracing the values of both you know, competing and, and building a business and thinking you could do that, but also caring. And let me just tell you, I spend a lot of my time speaking to CEOs of large global companies. And I can't tell you how many of the courageous ones I have met have told me a story 
about how their daughter asked them a tough question and how that became the moment that transformed them. And so one of those examples is uh, one of the B-team leaders. He's a CEO of a massive um, um, company, global company, that's been very successful. And his daughter asked him one day a very simple question. She came home and said, Daddy, are you proud of every product you sell? And her daddy started thinking, this is six years ago, this company now embraces ESG in, in its entire portfolio. He even invites the next generation, the children of his board members, into a board meeting once a year to ask challenging questions. Mm -hmm. Think about innovative governance. So in addition to closing the gender gaps, I'm a huge passionate believer in closing the generational gap in the dialogues we're having. We are just not in touch with how this next generation feels and we need to hear their voices. There are lots of innovative ways to do it, but I can't leave the conversation there. But let's think about mothers and sons as well. And let's think about the fact that we've been holding up this idea of a strong man uh, for so long and our boys are also breaking from it because they do not want that world either. So I think as we say, you know, there might be interesting things for fathers and daughters, I think um, I, mothers and sons. And, and let's, let's start raising courageous girls and emotionally intelligent boys. And we actually might fix this world, but we only have a decade to get this right. So we need to fix ourselves as well. We cannot just wait for the next generation or leave all of the world's challenges to the next generation. We have to have the courage and the humility to face the mirror ourselves. Laura, I want to add something to that. I think we're living in a world that's so culturally diverse, but you come from one of the most forward-looking countries on the planet, and there's so many cultural challenges that are even harder in other countries when you talk about having courageous conversations between men and women. I have a husband like you that's super supportive, and we have those courageous conversations all the time. But in cultures where it's such still a patriarchy, and you're right, my, I have your sense of urgency, and we've talked about this, how do we create a system that allows for them to transition to this new mm. way of thinking? Mm. You want to take one more question? Yes, why do you yeah? do that, Laura? Thank you, uh, uh, Hala. I admire you deeply because one of the reasons why B Women is is doing so well is because we take a lot of your of your uh, of your initiatives and, and and vision. So my question is about a B Team. You uh, you mentioned many times that B Team is like a, a think tank, uh, 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 like a, a lobbying, but in a way that the, you do it in, in a way that it really creates action and results. Uh, what's happening with the problem that we have uh, in shifting from a traditional economy to a more triple bottom line economy? How are we going to deal with a, a long term, uh, uh, with with a short term capital uh, vision that we have now towards uh, long term investments and long term uh, strategies? I actually, uh, ironically, and maybe I'm simplifying, I think that there is a similar answer um, to both of your questions. You might not think so initially, but, and I'm not going to say that I'm an expert at the cultural challenges, although we think deeply about them. And many of our partnerships at the B team are, are with civil society and particularly people who are working at the grassroots re level on, on modern slavery or how we kind of clean up our supply chains or how we deal with the incredible uh, crisis of inequality across the globe and within specific countries. So some of these things, whether it is um, closing the gender gap or making sure that uh, we do right, not just in our own businesses, but also take responsibility for our supply chains. And some of the things that have to do with shifting from the short-term mindset to long-term mindset in business and shifting from measuring only financial profit to measuring what actually matters, and of course our impact on planet and people matters, um, have to do with policy changes. So in addition to B team trying to advocate for our own leaders to clean their own house and leading by brave action in their own companies and trying to constantly move the norms to a higher standard on that, we actually collectively try to advocate that there are some things that are gonna require policies to simple policy interventions. We can't fix everything, and I know that there's a inertia in business about that, and we don't like the go to trust the government to interact. But even in the progressive area of the Nordics, we did not have gender balance in the boardroom until we had gender quota. And when it comes to taking responsibility for the supply chain and, and the treatment of people, I actually think that there might be um, some good evidence for some policies. The one I would advocate for to begin with, to kind of shift norms, um, is that we 
redefine the definition of success through what we audit and look at and demand from companies to disclose, put targets around and measure. So whether we call that ESG or stake, whatever we call that, we need to start. And I don't know that there is any one way to go there. And I don't know that the regulation needs to be that this is the way that you have to do it. But I do think we currently have legislation that says that the only role of a board director and a company is to maximize shareholder value. And until we shift those policies, I'm afraid, uh, and policies on infrastructure, et cetera, um, we're not going to be able to tackle this effectively just by asking leaders to show more courage and accountability. I think you might know that in England we're now moving to change that legislation. There so is a, an interesting bill on the table in England, yes. Just one last question. Sorry, we were out of time. Just wait for the mic. We have to take one from a man because I believe in gender balance both oh, ways. Yeah. But I can't see her. But okay. <laughs> so you're going to have to take two now. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, but wonderful. Um, Iceland leads the way, obviously, in terms of gender, um, uh, you know, making sure the gender gap is filled. Uh, I'm from Rwanda, and you've heard about Rwanda's you, story about yes. uh, gender balance in Rwanda. But really, it is possible. I've been in practice, international development practice, for 27 years, and I've seen change happen. Before genocide in Rwanda, there was zero women in the leadership. After genocide in, uh, in the process of recovery, a gender agenda became a thing. Mainstreaming gender is responsibility and decision you have to make. So I think we really have to make that responsibility and take action and make it happen because it's possible. So, but the question for you, uh, really you have incredible experience. Um, what I see is how much money is spent from different governments advancing development around the world, especially from the third world countries, uh, particularly in the US, where they spend trillion dollars in, in the countries. And they support gender on the paper, but not in practice. So how do you advise governments as they move businesses and policies around the world to include gender agenda and in their program? And before, would you pass, uh, would you've asked for one male... Is there a Steve question? in the room? Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, Paul. Paul is also sadly, one of those sadly, names. Sad, sadly, Paul, yes. Sorry. And so, probably, so I, you've, you kind of answered the question I wanted to ask a moment ago, but I come from my business is finance, it's asset management, responsible investment. But um, I think, as we know, this is just fact, Finance is the most psychopathically profiled, and the more we have a more psychopathic profile of people in financing. Over the last fifty years, when we talk about this maximising a profit, finance has largely taken over the way that business is done because everything is driven by capital allocation. It's financial, financial engineering through it. And the question I wanted to ask is: I totally agree. The, I think the regulation needs to change. We've got the SEC putting blocks in against. ESG in the US. At the same time, you've got Ian Silk, who's CEO of Aussie Super, saying if you're not doing ESG, you're breaking the law in Australia. So, mm -hmm. dynamic happening. But do you think that one of the do you think the if we get that change and the purpose of business is different, that could be one of the biggest things we do to actually bring more females into it? Because mm -hmm. I wonder whether a lot of them are kept out, not because. I, I've just done a CEO hire, and I've hired a brilliant CEO. I have to say that because one of my colleagues is in the room. But I asked for a profile. I wanted a woman, mm -hmm. and, and we've, we've done lots of roles where we've looked for women, and there just aren't any. Mm -hmm. And we always talk about we're not giving them the opportunity. I wonder if the desire is there because the intention of what they're being asked to do drive shareholder value mm. actually isn't as attractive as it might be if the purpose was different. Mm. Okay, wonderful questions, both of you. If I go first to Rwanda, I mean, it's such a good example of how a nation that didn't really embrace gender got brought peace and prosperity to a really troubled country through the leadership of women. Amazing story. If you think about it, Rwanda has placed in the top few seats of the World Economic Forum closing the gender gap report for a few years running, whereas the US keeps sliding down. I think it's in 46th place right now. So what are you going to believe in if you're an investor? Are you going to believe in the future prosperity of Rwanda? 
Or are you thinking that the U.S. is going to maintain its competitiveness by this sort of lack of attention to this issue? I think I would ask myself that as an investor because I'm not a big believer in the rear view mirror evaluation of what is going to deliver returns, but actually looking through the front window and really thinking about what's going to happen. So I, I want to try to, I mean, it's such a complicated answer I could go in and what it takes. So I'm going to do a simple one, I'm sorry. But if we want to change how we do things, we have to change who is in power. The only way to change how we do business, how we do public policies, is by changing who's around the table that has those conversations. So I'm a huge proponent of deliberate action in that, whether we call them voluntary targets or, or desired quotas or progressive uh, goals of closing these gaps. That, to me, is the key. I don't think you can put gender on the agenda <coughs> with one gender at the table. And it goes both ways. So let's just change the numbers in order to change what gets on the agenda and how it gets discussed and evaluated. So I'm a huge proponent for that, at least as a short-term measure. Now, the most progressive companies are doing this. Now, some think it's pretty bold to say we're going to get there by 2030. Well, I think by 2030, we need to deliver the global goals, the sustainable developmental goals. So that means we need to have gender balance by 2025. Because once women get in charge, they fix it, sorry, with men with men. Once we have gender balance, we will fix the things that need to be fixed because of exactly your question, Paul. So the definition of success for most women and many good men is much bigger than financial. We all know it as human beings. We might make all the money in the world, but if our children aren't happy or we're not in good health or we can't ble breathe clean air, is that success? So I just think that that meaning and that purpose is especially important to women, and which is part of why we change the game when we get to be around the table. And it's part of the reason why we lose. Well, we have a trouble attracting women <coughs> to finance. Believe me, I founded an investment company with an ESG lens 12 years ago, and people thought we were crazy when we said we want to put feminine values into finance. Why did we want to do that? We saw some of the most capable women leaving that sector again and again, the world over, because there wasn't a culture that resonated with them. So even if they were attracted into the companies, they were not retained because they didn't give that meaning, that calling, that purpose that we as human beings desire. And I just think women are maybe more courageous in saying, I don't want this, than many men who often feel I have the responsibility of earning an income for the family. That's maybe more the traditional view. So maybe I put up with it because I actually believe men need it just as much which is why we think in the Nordic area, when we get gender balance in parenting, at home or at work, we actually it, we create more inclusive, better workplaces for all. It's as simple as that. Hella, thank you so much for sharing your personal story and also for challenging us, challenging not just our organization, YPO, to step up, as particularly on this gender issue, but also our membership to step up in all the ways that you suggested. We can and must do so much. And some of us, as I touched on, hundreds are doing fantastic things around the world, but there's never enough and time is against us. We have to act and thank you for stimulating that thought. My pleasure. Thank you for asking questions and listening and inviting me to do this because at the end of the day, we may be working with the biggest global business in the world, and they have a lot of power. But ultimately, about 90% of the economy is small, medium-sized, privately held businesses. So you are the key to actually making this shift happen. So to all of you, be a change catalyst, embrace a bigger definition of success, and, and make business a force for good. And, and together we'll make this together happen. Together we can make this happen. Woo!